Uh, thank you. Before I begin my presentation, I just wanted to thank the Meyer family in particular um, for the, the forum here today and also to thank Rob Cinnamon. Um, I see Rob every year when he comes down to our feedlot. We run a, a steer trial um, with the Australian National Field Days and um, Yugaba enters steers in that every year. Um, Yugaba won this year. Um, and it's when he asked me earlier this year to come and present, I was very keen because of the cattle that Yugaba produce um, do well every year in that competition. So I was really interested to see the operation and what they do here. So thank you, Rob, for the invitation. <clears throat> I wanted to talk quickly I'll just run through what I'll cover today. I'll talk about who I am, and my role in the industry, the businesses that my husband and I own, and then talk in particular about um, the Australian Lot, Fed, Lot Feeders Association and the grain-fed beef industry. So to begin with, um, Rob gave me the topic of the challenges that the grain-fed beef industry faces. I put opportunities in brackets because there's some, I'm really quite optimistic about where our industry is at the moment and where we're heading. Uh, first of all, to introduce our businesses. Uh, we own Gundermain and Ladysmith feedlots. Gundermain's located in the central west of New South Wales at a place called Yagara. Uh, Ladysmith is located just outside Wagga. Uh, combined capacity of 12,500 head. Uh, the key to our business is location, location and location. So we're near grain fed area, um, grain producing areas. We're near cattle producing areas. We're close to processes. We're close to small towns where we can access some um, workforce and services. It's, both sites are owner managed. So my husband and I uh, manage both sites. All the cattle on both sites are owned by us. We started out custom feeding, but we've moved into ownership of cattle. Uh, we're licensed by the EPA. We're NFAS. NFAS, you may hear a little bit in my presentation, stands for the National Feedlot Accreditation Scheme. MSA, Meat Standards Australia Accredited. WQA, Woolworths Quality Assurance Accredited. Uh, we source our cattle from both paddock and sale yards. Uh, we benchmark everything we do through our industry consultant, a, a vet and a nutritionist. We measure everything we do and we're very technology intensive. Uh, we manage our risk through break evens. All of our cattle are forward contracted. Uh, we know what price we're getting out the other end so that we know what price to buy in for. Um, a little bit of history very quickly to, um, we built uh, Gundermain feedlot, we then built a second feedlot up at Canamble, 10,000 head yard, uh, then we bought Ladysmith feedlot and sold our um, part in Canamble feedlot just because we wanted to concentrate on the two businesses that we owned ourselves. Um, I tell people that we have no business partners, it's just so that Andrew and I only have to argue with each other. But it's, only, it's also because we can make decisions very quickly. We're a very nimble business and a very flexible business. And I believe that's the beauty of family-run operations. The Australian beef industry profile very quickly. I pinched this from my vet who pre presented at our BeefX conference last year. It's a quick snapshot of the industry. Um, about 26 million head. Um, You've got slaughter figures there, how many are grass-fed and how many grain-fed, uh, average carcass weights, uh, dressing percentages and what they run between, how much is exported and domestic, and also it mentions our um, uh, per head consumption, um, which is declining. Now, Mark Greening from Cattle Council presented to you on red meat industry structure. Um, I presented at the Grains Industry Conference in Melbourne yesterday. I used this same slide 
I called it then acronym overload. The only thing they tweeted was this slide. So it's, it is confusing and it is full of acronyms. It's not just important who the acronyms are, but the relationship of the acronyms to each other and what one acronym, acronym might have done to the other acronym 20 years ago. The blue there are the um, peak industry councils. Now Mark's been through this, I'll run through them very quickly. AMIC is the meat industry council, ALIC are the live exporters, ALPHA are ourselves, cattle council, sheep meats council and the goat industry council. Some of those are members of NFF, the National Farmers Federation. All of those peak industry councils feed down to ARMAC, the Red Meat Advisory Council, and Don Mackay, um, who chairs ARMAC, will be presenting this afternoon. I'm also, because I chair a peak industry council, I'm a director of ARMAC as well. They also feed into an organisation called Safe Meat, and Safe Meat is responsible for food safety. Uh, Safe Meat has members of the peak industry councils and state and federal government sitting around the table. Above the line. Above and below the line is really important. Below the line is policy. Peak Industry Council Territory, and two speakers have mentioned this already this morning, Richard Norton and Mark Greening. Above the line is delivery. They're your service organisations. <clears throat> so that diagram gives you an idea where we fit in the red meat industry structure. We're a little bit different to the other peak industry councils. We are not aligned to a state farming organisation. We're a national body with a completely directly elected board. Um, we have directors from every... We try to get representation nationally, so we have directors from every state except Tasmania. Tasmania only has the one feedlot. But all the other states are represented on our board. We work very hard at succession planning on our board. We have 30% of our board are women and we have a mixture of corporate and family businesses represented on that board. It's an extraordinary board to work with, um, very altruistic board. Uh, they most definitely have the best interests of the industry at heart in all their decision making. Our membership structure is again slightly different to the other peak industry councils. Uh, we have about 150 direct members uh, we then have a range of other membership, platinum members, um, and they are essentially our sponsors. We fund ourselves. Um, we fund ourselves through sponsorship, through events. Uh, we run at least two workshops a year, including very successful animal welfare officer training, where we've trained 250 people throughout feedlots with certified animal welfare training. <coughs> We also have student members, we have associate members, and they can be anyone associated with the beef industry who'd like to become a member. Where are the feedlots? So this map will give you an idea where feedlots are located in Australia. Uh, there's a cluster, obviously, in that southern Queensland area. Feedlots basically follow the grain growing areas. Um, uh, but extend a little bit further north in Queensland than some of the traditional grain growing areas. Our feedlots, as I said, are located in central and southern New South Wales. And you can see a cluster in northern New South Wales there as well. Why did the grain-fed beef industry start in Australia? We have a history book out, the Grain-Fed History Book. Um, and John Condon here from Beef Central did quite a bit of work on that book. Um, this is an old picture from that book, it's Wanui Feedlot, and I'm thinking it's about late 1950s, early 1960s. It'll give you an idea about how far we've progressed. So you can see the sort of cattle that were being fed, and you can also see the bunk, and also the, the sort of feed that is within that bunk is quite different to what you'd see in a bunk today. So the beginnings of our industry were really just people are like, like ourselves value-adding their grain. Then, <clears throat> um, this was throughout the 1960s. Initially, they were just fed for the domestic market when conditions were a bit tougher. 
It was very seasonal. There were no premium quality, um, uh, no premium grids then for grain-fed beef. In the 1970s, the Japanese introduced a quota beef market and the first exports of Australian grain-fed beef then went to Japan. Exports now account for about 70% of our production um, and we, we export to nearly 100 countries. But the Australian feedlot industry is different to other feedlot industries throughout the world. We're a finishing system. Uh, the US, oh, I think it's about 95% of their cattle will go into a feedlot. Here, the, low, the, the number is much lower. Um, the days on feed can be similar, but we're, we, we just are a finishing system. Most cattle in, in Australia who've been on a feedlot spend most of their life on grass. Um, a few FAQs. Uh, why do we have feedlots? Average days on feed, 50 to 120 days, 10 to 15% of their lifespan. There's space legislation. Why do we feed grain? It's highly digestible. It's available. It's a natural product. Cattle have been eating grain for thousands of years. Grain is just the seeds of grass. Uh, we have significantly less emissions than grain-fed beef, a uh, grass-fed beef, and that's simply because we can get cattle to market weights quicker. Numbers on feed. This is an interesting slide. Our last survey released had over a million head on feed, the highest ever. I'm often asked to predict what will happen next. Um, I'm reluctant to do that, but I don't think that will go down anymore. I think we've reached a new trading band. There's a new era in where grain-fed cattle fit within the beef supply chain. I don't think that will be affected um, significantly. You can see the lows in 2007, 2008. That's high grain prices. Um, Grain-fed cattle as a percentage of adult, adult cattle slaughter turnoff uh, reaches up well above 40%. <clears throat> I'll skip through some of these. That's Charlie with my son. We shouldn't ever give them names, but we do. I'll touch briefly on the National Feedlot Accreditation Scheme. You cannot supply grain-fed beef unless you're accredited. The accreditation scheme is one of the success stories of our industry. It's the oldest QA system in Australia. It's been around for at least 25 years. It's gotten much more stringent over time and that's fine because our consumers are asking for more over time as well. Um, we sign a docket, an NFAS docket on, on the way out for our cattle which guarantees megajoules of energy and days on feed and that it's underpinned by a complete quality assurance system. So to the, the title of the presentation, Challenges and Opportunities, I'm going to pick out just a few of these. Um, you can see there, um, it's, a lot of these are very similar to what the grass-fed industry faces, but there are a few that I'd like to pick out. Uh, community perceptions is one around what we do and how we do it. Um, when we do the consumer testing that Richard Norton mentioned earlier, um, people associate grain-fed beef with high quality and it's a premium, um, but there are some concerns about our production system, which we as the Peak Industry Council are trying to address. We've just released a series of videos called Love Your Work, and I'd encourage you to go onto our website and have a look at those. It involves some of the people in our industry, and I've listed there our people as one of our strengths. In particular, we've got... Um, uh, besides our industry board, we've got the people who work within our industry. There are a lot of women work in feedlots, a lot of young women in particular. There's a diversity. Um, it's, a, it's an energetic, it's um, a passionate industry. And um, in particular, we champion and, and try to progress those sorts of people who are invested in our industry. Uh, there are whole feedlots that are staffed by women. Um, there are feedlot women managers, there are... Uh, three women on our board. It's an industry that celebrates diversity um, and in actual fact that's the key to, to our success. <clears throat> Where to from here? I think cattle numbers on feed will remain high. Um, there'll be 40% grain fed production share in 2017. I'm, these, I'm pulling some of these numbers from um, MLA market reports. Um, then 
MLA are uh, forecasting a drop in numbers on feed. I don't think it will be as significant as that. It's not what we're actually finding from our survey figures. This, there is a very strong interest in feedlot expansion in Queensland in particular. Those feedlots are full. Our custom feeding yards are full. Um, I, I cannot see that number dropping significantly. I talked to the Grains Industry Conference yesterday about the drivers. It's grain and cattle. They're our two major inputs. Grain is one of our major drivers. Grain prices are generally low. I hate to tell you, but they're much lower in the south than in the north, and that's one of the things that's making it work at the moment. Finally, um, this is my plug for our own event. We're at Smart Beef, which will be held on the 1st to the 3rd of November. We hold a conference every year. Our big conference is BeefX, which is held on the, um, held on the Gold Coast. Um, this Smart Beef is new. It used to be called uh, Beef Works, but Smart Beef, we're setting it on a, on a, at a university site. Uh, we'll be having visits to Sundown Pastoral. We'll have a DEXA machine there with the help of MLA because um, objective carcass measurement, as Richard mentioned this morning, is one of the keys to um, the future of our industry. Um, if you're interested, you can visit our website. But this event is targeted at not only feedlot producers but at grass-fed producers. If you're, if you're feeding into the grain-fed beef supply chain, it will, it, this event is designed for you. So I'd encourage you to come along if you can. But again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and more than happy to take questions. Um, thanks very much there, um, Tess, and uh, very informative. It's great to um, see that thing coming up in November as well. Is there any questions? It's also great to see the um, women in the industry and well supported too, Tess. Uh, no questions, but all the speakers are here today, ladies and gentlemen, so if you wish to um, talk to them after um, the program or before the program, feel free to come and see them. So thanks very much. I'll just hand you over to Mr. Rob Cinnamon. Tess, uh, on behalf of Eagle Bar Pastoral Company, just a little gift uh, of our appreciation. Thank you very, very much for coming here today and, and uh, telling us all uh, the role of Alpha and, uh, and uh, what's happening at, at Gundermain and, and in the Herbert family. So thank you very much again for your contribution.